Welcome to what is most likely going to be the absolutely most depressing masterclass you will ever experience. And it is intentional because we're going to huddle up with our characters deep down in the dark cave where they experience their dark night of the soul. We're going to feel sorry for ourselves. We're going to be in a deep funk and we're going to wish we died. And for once, I'm not going to say enjoy this masterclass, but suffer with us. We're all familiar with that phrase, things will get worse before they get better. Now, if you think about how a good story flows, you want to go to the darkest place before we go into the third act. We want to make sure that everything we have imagined that could go wrong for our character actually does go wrong. And we have to see them at their deepest, darkest place. That is not too dissimilar from other psychological approaches. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, she was a psychologist who identified the stages of grief, found five stages. And again here, this is merely an attempt to label what we see out there in the real world. It doesn't mean that this is exactly how it is. It's a way of communicating about it. The first stage, denial. In the hero's journey, we see that as being the refusal of the call. Anger is the second stage. There's anger in many characters, in many stories, and often that comes out in the first half of Act 2. There's a bargaining. And if you want to learn more about it, just look it up. These stages were initially developed for people who were diagnosed with a terminal illness and went into this grief, grieving process about losing life, but it is, it is broader. And bargaining can be bargaining with the... Um, super being with you know, your, your faith with God but it can also be in a relationship when there's a breakup bargaining to please you know be able to get back again depression is the next stage and that's what we're going to talk about today and uh, you need to get through that in order to reach the holy grail of acceptance so today focus on that fourth stage of grief which is depression in some stories that will be an extended stage and other stories that's only a very brief moment now where does that fit in to the hero's journey we're familiar with the ordinary world the call to adventure there's that refusal the denial meeting with a mentor crossing the first thresh, uh, threshold into the second act where we meet allies enemies and tests and then there's an approach to the inmost cave i like to see that going from the midpoint reversal because the midpoint reversal is the moment when the hero is becoming aware of what the problem is and they're going to try and do something about it even though they may not be fully ready to admit it to the outside world they're not ready to shed their skin yet to to change their identity because that is what happens once they've gone past the dark night of the soul so approach to the inmost cave in my thinking, that starts from the halfway point, the midpoint reversal. It's that reversal that makes the hero realize that the old ways didn't work and now they need to take a, a new approach. The ordeal is the, um, the test, the ultimate test that the hero goes through in the cave. So once they've reached that cave, that's where they go through it. This is both physical and psychological. So it's both visual and internal. If you... Uh, successfully go through that stage if our characters successfully get through the ordeal they will receive a reward and that reward we call the seizing of the sword in mythological terms and then they're ready to uh, travel back home that's the third threshold the threshold into the third act the second threshold was the approach to the immersed cave and then the third act has its climax in the resurrection resurrection we'll see a few of those elements of resurrection today in our class already and then finally, we have the return with the elixir. Where does today's class fit in? It sits in the ordeal stage. In traditional story terminology, that is sometimes also called the crisis. Remember our fractal class when we're talking about three-act structure, eight-sequence structure, and how that works on different levels. What we talk about today sits somewhere in the F sequence. That could be an extended time within that sequence or it could be just a moment and if it's just a moment it will be closer to the beginning of act three 
So it's the darkest moment is always the closest to where hope comes back in. Some people are familiar with the phrase, the all is lost moment. Um, now, how is that different from the dark night of the soul? In Blake Snyder's book, Save the Cat, he explains it very simple. simply. He says, all is lost is how it is for the world. That's the ex external situation. The dark night of the soul is how the character experiences it. I'm going to open with a classic setup to the all is lost moment. This is out of Gladiator. And um, you would expect that epic movies that have an epically long duration, they will also have the stages extended. And that is often the case. But in Gladiator, everything happens very quickly in this particular stage. You'll see that Maximus loses many of his friends. And there's a lot of death. And death is one of the elements in the Dark Knight of the Soul. But it all happens within less than two minutes. That is nothing. This uh, high point for the villain we also see in Raiders of the Lost Ark. Now that's an interesting uh, example because in the Indiana Jones movies, because of the tone of these films, you will never go really deep and you can, you can argue that there's not really a case of depression. It stays fairly lighthearted. You bastards! I'll get you for this! Indiana Jones? Adieu. So the snakes are the association with death in this scene. We also see the hero down below in a cave. But it's not really depression. In that respect, Indiana Jones is slightly different from your average cave moment. And he's also not alone, where typically the character would be alone when they go through the um, experience of the Dark Knight of the Soul. In Bridesmaids, it's really clear that our hero... Uh, first loses her best friend, then she lets go of her friend, the cop. And here, finally, she also lets go of that wonderful character played by John Hamm. Goodbye, Ted. You know, if you're trying to turn me on, it's working. You used me. No big deal. You are no longer my number three. And she ends up all alone, arguably for the first time in the story. And that often happens to the hero. They find themselves completely isolated. As I said, some characters get through it. Some characters survive that stage. Other characters don't.
the darkest moment from Dead Poet Society towards the end of Act 2, where one of the students um, takes his own life. Now, the main character, uh, Robin Williams' character, ironically here, typically you have the death of the mentor in these moments towards the end of Act 2. And here, um, it's, it's the mentor of the students who goes through his own Dark Knight of the Soul alone in the classroom. And this is the end of the Dark Knight of the Soul moment because this is already the reward. Here Robin Williams doesn't seize the day but he seizes the sword. And this poem by Thoreau is essentially the message and the wisdom that he needs to go forth. And often we see that where the hero receives the final words of encouragement or, or advice at the end of Act 2 that then helps them to go into Act 3 and do what they need to do. The Dark Knight of the Soul is often a place where we are not just alone, but we're incarcerated. The environment feels like a prison, a box. It's often... Um, subterranean is often a cave or a prison or a basement. The transplantation? Well, partial, actually. The piece of your brain connected to your nervous system needs to stay put, keeping those intricate connections intact. So you won't be gone, not completely. A sliver of you will still be in there somewhere. Limited consciousness. You'll be able to see and hear what your body is doing, but your existence will be as a passenger. An audience, you'll live in a sunken place. Now you're in the sunken place. So Chris here sees this image of his future, which is the loss of his self. It's an image of death because he won't be around anymore. People will still see him, but it won't be the same Chris. So it's an image of death. It's a loss of self. And again, he is alone, just as uh, juror number three, although he's surrounded by another 11 jurors, he's still alone in that room in the moment of the dark night of the soul. Now, interestingly, at this particular point, there is a strong, there's a long monologue in um, 12 Angry Men, but still, this is the moment when the main character, or the transformational character, rather, is confronted with uh, the truth. You're alone. I don't care whether I'm alone or not. It's my right. It's your right. What do you want? I say he's guilty. I want to hear your arguments. I gave you my arguments. We're not convinced. We want to hear them again. We have as much time as it takes. Everything, every single thing that took place in that courtroom, but I mean everything, says he's guilty. What do you think? I'm an idiot or something? Why don't you take that stuff about the old man? The old man who lived there and heard everything. Or oh, this business about the knife. What, because we found another one exactly like it? The old man saw him right there on the stairs. What's the difference how many seconds it was? Every single thing. The knife falling through a hole in his pocket. You can't prove he didn't get to the door. 
Sure, you can take all the time, hobble around the room, but you can't prove it! And what about this business of the L? And the movies? There's a phony deal if I ever heard one. I bet you $5,000 I'd remember the movies I saw. I'm telling you, everything that's gone on has been twisted and turned. This business with the glasses? How do you know she didn't have them on? This woman testified in open court. And what about hearing the kid yell? Huh? I'm telling you, I've got all the facts here. Here. Uh-oh. So the film is essentially converging to this moment. Um, initially, he's got support, and there are quite a few votes for guilty. At the end, he's alone, and this is where the truth comes to the foreground. This is not about the, um, the accused. It's about him and his relationship with his son. And it's now out in the open, and he has to face that moment. That moment at that point the room with the jurors becomes a prison for this character he's in the box the term the box comes back in quite a few films you know cool hand luke and then it's quoted again in uh, toy story 3 and the box also exists in the shawshank redemption again in association with prison trying to escape. Broke Captain Hadley's heart to shoot him. Truly it did. We just have to put it behind us. Move on. I'm done. Everything stops. This line, everything stops, indicates that for Andy Dufresne, it's the end of his life. It's the end of his life as he knew it. He's no longer willing to play with the warden. But then it turns out the warden still has the power and he will threaten him and he wants him to continue to work for him. So a high point for that villain and a low point for our hero. Similar image, not a box, but a silo in a quiet place. The daughter, who was ultimately responsible for the loss of the child in the beginning of the film, she is with her brother in the silo, in the corn silo, and... Um, she disappears under the corn in a moment that is for us an image of her uh, potential death. This near-death experience might be for her uh, a moment of atonement. It is through that experience, that meeting with death, that characters often reconnect and, um, and then have that, at, uh, that atonement. Um, it, this scene also reminded me of that scene from Star Wars 4, A New Hope, where they're in this trash compactor and Luke temporarily disappears under the, the filth. <laughs>
Scipio! It's a familiar scene, the walls closing in. It's essentially a metaphor for how the character feels at that particular point in time. In Up, the house has lost its color. The house has become somewhat of a prison and Carl now has to learn to let go. It's just before he's willing to surrender. This is not the house as he remembered it. And often Hero tries to go back to how things were previously, but then fails. All that effort brought him to this point. All right, back to death now with Avatar at the end of Act 2. The Tree of Souls, I think it's called, was attacked and is burning and the Navi are uh, fleeing. We see a short image of the mentor, uh, the uh, Avatar version of Grace, dead. And then we go back to our team who are in the box, in a prison. That's the cave at the end of Act 2. Again, a room not much bigger than a box where our team is imprisoned. Time to die. In Titanic, it's the death of the lover, but in a way, Jack is also the mentor. And we see very often in films that this is the point where the mentor dies. Um, it escapes me which film it is, but it's one of the Judd Apatow films where it's made, it turned into a, a joke because people sometimes feel, I mean, when I say people, it's primarily us filmmakers, that this feels like a cliche, but the interesting thing is that the audience doesn't feel it that way. It's what they expect and it is what works. Even in comedy, you'll have a down end of act two. There may be a death, sometimes the death of the mentor um, and sometimes the death of another character. This is from uh, Groundhog Day. Excuse me, sir. Are you the one who brought the old man in? Mm -hmm. How's he? Well, he just passed away. What did he die of? It was just old. It was just his time. I want to see his chart. Excuse me. Uh, sir. Sir, you can't come in here. Sir, this is a restricted area. Where's the chart? Sometimes people just die. Not today. Think about a fractal structure. You can see the stages of grief within this one scene. So in the film, we are in the depression stage. We are in the ordeal. We're in the dark night of the soul. But within the scene, down there at the we go through denial and anger and bargaining. Here you go. And we continue. Come on, Dad. Come on, Pop. Come on, Pop. Come on, come on, uh, come on, breathe, breathe, pop, breathe, pop.
So we see even in comedy, you have the depression stage within the depression stage. It's very powerful. So that's Phil Connor's Dark Knight of the Soul. He must accept now that he cannot stop death. death. And we'll see the next scene hereafter when he does his next uh, weather forecast stand up. He has accepted it and he's transformed. Not always very dark, but often just mentioning death. This is from Zootopia. The only animals going savage are predators. We cannot keep it a secret. We need to come forward. Hmm, great idea. Tell the public. And how do you think they're going to feel about their mayor, who is a lion? I'll be ruined. Well, what does Chief Bogo say? Chief Bogo doesn't know, and we are going to keep it that way. Someone's here. Sir, you need to go now. Security, sweep the area. Great, we're dead. We're dead, that's it. I'm dead, you're dead. Everybody's dead. Can you swim? What? Can I swim? Yes, I can swim. Why? So a very short moment of death, uh, just in dialogue, and then we have that image of rebirth. Because it's a, for a very short moment, we think that Judy might have drowned, and then she's there. So that's coming up from the water. It's an image of rebirth. The water, which may also have the connotation of heightened in, uh, uh, consciousness. So uh, being underwater, being the image of our subconscious. In... Uh, Pixar, very often we have fractal uh, cages, uh, caves rather. Sometimes we have these fractal dark nights of the soul. This is the one that you may be familiar with from a scene that I've played many times from Toy Story 2. Here is uh, Woody saving Wheezy with a very short box moment, a very short dark night of the soul when he disappears into the box. Hold on, hold on, hold on, he's got something. It's Wheezy! Wheezy? Wheezy? Hey, it's not suicide, it's a rescue! <laughs> so just mentioned in dialogue the suicide, but again in association with the box. It was Woody disappearing in the box where he got his reward. But the box is also where toys go to die, because that's when they don't get played with anymore. So there's a very, very powerful um, connotation in the dialogue with that moment in, in our story. Death, as I mentioned before, is very often the death of the mentor. And here is a short clip from The Untouchables in which Sean Connery plays Malone, the mentor to Elliot Ness. And at the same time the mentor dies, our villain has a high point. Great example of melodramatic editing, Brian De Palma in The Untouchables um, with Robert De Niro and Sean Connery and Kevin Costner. Uh, at the point Capone is experiencing his high moment in the opera, our mentor is dying. And again, you see the villain high up and our uh, mentor, our hero team down below. At this point in time in the story, the villain is a bigger hero. The, the villain has a high point and basks in their glory. Huh? Huh? Oh, come on! You gotta admit this is cool! Just like a movie! The robot will emerge dramatically, do some damage, throw in some screaming people, and just when all hope is lost, Syndrome will save the day! 
I'll be a bigger hero than you ever were. You mean you killed off real heroes so that you could pretend to be one? Oh, I'm real. Real enough to defeat you! And I did it without your precious gifts, your oh-so-special powers. I'll give them heroics. I'll give them the most spectacular heroics anyone's ever seen! And when I'm old and I've had my fun, I'll sell my inventions so that everyone can be superheroes. Everyone can be super! And when everyone's super... <laughs> no one will be. <laughs> Here I've cut a short section out of the film and we're going straight from the Dark Knight of the Soul, which is this moment, to the moment where our hero atones for his sins. But in between the section that I've cut out is exactly that high point for the shadow character. That's where the uh, syndrome has a great time with his robot out in the real world. I'm sorry. This is my fault. I've been a lousy father. Blind to what I have. So obsessed with being undervalued that I undervalued all of you. Dad? Shh, don't interrupt. So caught up in the past that I... I... You are my greatest adventure. And I almost missed it. I swear, I'm gonna get us out of this safely. Well, incident. I think Dad has made some excellent progress today, but I think it's time we wind down now. We need to get back to the mainland. I saw an aircraft hangar on my way in. Straight ahead, I think. In this, the moment when Mr. Incredible redeems himself, that's when the tone of the music clearly shifts. It clearly changes from what was elegic sad violins to a more upbeat, hopeful flute. And then when uh, this, the very moment Mr. Incredible has confessed his sins and said, I'm sorry, that's when Violet releases herself. There is absolutely no logic in there. If you think about if she can do it now, why didn't she do it before? But nobody had an issue with it with, because this is all about emotional logic. The moment Mr. Incredible has confessed his sins, that's when they deserve to be freed. And when it happens, it feels normal, it feels natural. And then the moment they start running, we are in Act 3, and you can hear that from the music picking up. Music and, um, and the pacing. So really, um, the, the pacing speeds up towards the end of Act 2, because we have the ordeal, then we have the reward, and then we have the crossing into Act 3 very quickly after one another. So you, you study this from the film, because often the director gives us hints as to where these beats are, and then you can go back and reverse engineer and look in the screenplay how that is, how that is written. But if you don't understand it, you can't write it. So you really need to uh, study these moments, not just look at them for your entertainment. Another example of a hero who is superseded by the villain is in Iron Man. Ah, Tony. When I uh, ordered the hit on you, I worried that I was killing the golden goose. <laughs> but you see, it was just fate that you survived that. You had one last golden egg to give. You really think that just because you have an idea, it belongs to you? Your father. He helped give us the atomic bomb. Now, what kind of world would it be today if he was as selfish as you? victory, false victory at least, of the shadow character in Iron Man. The exact same moment now from Die Hard. It's gonna go. It's gonna go!
probably pissing in the fence right now. <laughs> And that was the Ninth Symphony for Hans Gruber, the moment of victory when the vault opens. At the same time, we see the lowest point for John McClane, and that's the moment when John McClane finally says, I'm sorry. He's talking over the radio to his black pal, um, Powell, and he asks him to find his wife and bring her a message. I told her it took me a while to figure out uh, what a jerk I've been. But, um, that, that when things started to pan out for her, I should have been more supportive and, uh, I just should have been behind her more. Oh, shit. Tell her that, um, that she is the best thing that ever happened to a bum like me. She's heard me say I love you a thousand times. She never heard me say I'm sorry. And I want you to tell her that, Alan. I want you to tell her that uh, John said that he was sorry. Okay? You got that, man? Yeah, I got it, John. But you can tell her that yourself. You just watch your ass and you'll make it out of there, you hear me? Well, like I said, something to the man upstairs. John? John? What the fuck were you doing upstairs, Hans? Yeah, I always had a problem with that line of dialogue where he triggers himself into realizing that Hans Gruber was on the roof for a reason or was on the way to the roof for a reason. And then the, re the reference to the man upstairs obviously has some spiritual connotations. And um, this is where the supernatural aid comes in. It is where our hero has done everything they, ca they can. This is the point where the hero has to surrender because they have run out of options and they need to have faith. They need to hand over to the force in Star Wars. And often you'll see that help comes from above. And that could be literal, it could be figurative, um, or there's a hint that the help comes from above. This is one of my favorite Dark Knights of the Soul uh, from Toy Story 3. Help comes from above in Toy Story 3. The moment Woody takes Buzz's hand is a critical moment because it's an answer to a shot that we saw at the end of Act 1 where he refuses 
to shake Buzz's hand. And that's what the film is about. It's the thematic value. So Woody will not have done everything he could until he accepted Buzz's hand. And that's the point where he has to hand it over. So at that point, there's nothing else he can do. And that's the point where he needs to have faith. And the faith is rewarded. The help comes from above. I'm not going to tell you who is the help here. If you haven't seen Toy Story 3, you definitely have to do it. It's a wonderfully written film. And it, um, it's a great class in excellent screenwriting. Going back to Gladiator. In the early part of this class, I showed you the all is lost moment. I showed you the setup for the Dark Knight of the Soul. But it was not yet the Dark Knight of the Soul. We didn't see uh, Maximus in that moment in the cave where there's no way out. Here we're going to see him facing Commodus and then um, we see his resurrection. So a very quick transition from that Dark Knight of the Soul and then coming up literal resurrection and again the light comes from above in that moment you loved my father i know but so did i that makes us brothers doesn't it smile for me now brother <laughs> strap on his armor conceal the wound In that moment, we see the hero atone for their sins. They say, I'm sorry. One of the biggest sorry scenes is the public confession by Stuart in phone booth. I'm not a, not a murderer or a child molester, but a publicist who has fantasies about pretty little actresses, huh? who spends all his money on Italian suits and dry cleaning so people think he's important, who doesn't waste his time being nice to people who aren't any use to him. These are my crimes. Stuart, I know your crimes. Tell them. This is Stuart in the phone booth making amends to all the people that he has wronged, that he's harmed in his life. It's almost a step in the 12-step program where the character has to make amends to themselves, to God and to another person. And it's often the case. Now, the crimes by Stuart were not literal crimes. Sometimes the character actually does appear before court and does their confession right there. I lost my cat. It's probably the only soul that truly loved me, maybe ever. And I lost my friend, who may have been an idiot, but he, he tolerated me. And it was nice to have her around. And I think I have realized that I am not a real writer and that I think in the end it, I would say it was not worth it I would say that uh, I will accept the judgment of the court as valid and fulfill whatever sentence I may receive with full understanding that I have earned said punishment. We haven't talked about television a lot. Here's one of my favorite movies. Here's one of my favorite moments out of my favorite TV show. It is the Dark Knight of the Soul of Jimmy McNulty in The Wire. In season one, something happens that brings our hero to his lowest point and it happens proportionally where you would see it if, the, if that season were the timeline of your story. So there's an episode that's called The Cost, in which one of the 
uh, colleagues of Jimmy McNulty is shot and she's fighting for her life and Jimmy McNulty feels guilty. He is uh, the sinner. He's struggling with three addictions and as a result of one of those addictions, this happened. And there's a wonderful scene here where you'll see one character come out of character. It's his superior Rawls who hates his guts. And when that character turns and shows compassion, you know that our hero must be in a very, very dark place. And I love this scene because it is a, it's a twist on that high point for the villain, because it could have been a moment for Rawls, the major, the superior, to bask in his superiority, but he doesn't. He stands up, he takes um, Jimmy McNulty, and um, he's there for him. Now, the, the dialogue is wonderful. I have to warn you uh, for the profanity, but what he says here is arguably the nicest thing he said in nine episodes. Listen to me, you fuck. You did a lot of shit here. You played a lot of fucking cards, and you made a lot of fucking people do a lot of fucking things they didn't want to do. This is true. We both know this is true. Dr. Ralston, please call cardiology. Dr. Ralston. You and McNulty are a gaping asshole. We both know this. Fuck if everybody in CID doesn't know it. But fuck if I'm going to stand here and say you did a single fucking thing to get a police shot. You did not do this, you fucking hear me? This is not on you. No, it isn't, asshole. Believe it or not, everything isn't about you. And the motherfucker saying this? He hates your guts, McNulty. So you know if it was on you? I'd be the son of a bitch to say so. <sighs> Shit went bad. She took two for the company. That's the only lesson here. Wonderful character moment. If you've seen the show up to this point, it is arguably one of the most moving moments. And it may not seem that, but that's great writing. You set it up to the point where you surprise and move the audience. Um, the beginning of next episode, the teaser of the next episode, Jimmy is meeting with his uh, the superior of, of the leader of the detail that he's... Um, outsourced to, so to speak. And now the conversation is on a different level. He's, a li he's recovered somewhat, and now he can face the truth. Oh, fuck this case. Fuck it, huh? Now you're just gonna what? Call off your little crusade? <sighs> is that what you think it was? Crusade? Avon Barksdale was just a way for me to show everyone how smart I was and how fucked up the department is, that's all. Just put Jimmy McNulty up on your shoulders. March him around the room. Break out the keg. It was never about Avon Barksdale, Lieutenant. It's all about me. You think I didn't know that? You think we all didn't know? So it is Jimmy McNulty's um, uh, addiction to his job that landed his colleague Kima in hospital. And here, this is his confession. And you see these scenes are crafted very differently from what we've seen as other moments of the Dark Knight of the Soul, but essentially they fulfill the same function. I want to show you that there is there's great freedom in the way you approach these scenes. Now, The Wire is not your average screen drama. It, it brings a lot of things to a new level, and it's what, where it really, really excels. And in other mainstream films, you may have a more traditional approach to the Dark Knight of the Soul. I found that Moonlight, the Barry Jenkins Oscar winner, had uh, its own take. Here, the confession is not by the main character either. Here it is by the mother. I messed up. I mean, I fucked it all the way up. I know that. But your heart ain't gotta be black like mine, baby. I love you, Sharon. I do. I love you, baby. 
me. You ain't got to love me. Lord knows I did not have love for you when you needed it. I know that. So you ain't got to love me. But you going to know that I love you. You hear? You hear me, Sharon? I hear you, Mama. There's something I forgot to mention. You are always encouraged to write subtext and to not have characters say what they mean and what they feel. These moments are different. When you hit the dark night of the soul, that's when there is no surface layer anymore. Everything comes to the surface. Everything is out in the open. So you can write on the nose because characters will now for the first time honestly, truthfully say what they feel and how they feel. And that is very clear in these few scenes here from Moonlight and before that from The Wire. We're going to close on a somewhat uh, more upbeat note. And for that, we go to the ocean. Wilson! 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 I'm sorry! I'm sorry, Wilson! I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Oh, Wilson. I'm coming in. Let's go. Let's go. And we're walking. Okay, we're walking. Heel. Heel. No pee. No, pee. not on the carpet. Okay, we're coming. We're coming in. Everybody's in and having fun. We're having fun. And heel. We're healing. Heel. And I promise you puppies in there they were. The puppies from Bridesmaids, they're all alive and well. And there's a lot of healing going on because that is exactly what we're talking about at this particular point in the story. If the character goes through the dark night of the soul, they're ready to heal. Or maybe the healing is in that moment. Who knows? That was likely the most depressing masterclass you will ever experience. But at least... There were puppies at the end, and I hope you enjoyed those. If you want more masterclasses, check out the channel and subscribe so you never miss a new masterclass or any video that's uh, published at the time when you want to see it. And I would appreciate also if you could give us a like for this particular video. If you're interested to witness these masterclasses live and ask questions, you can do so. Just check out the information underneath the video and you can enroll for a whole series of masterclasses. They are really affordable. So have a look at that and maybe uh, you'll be with us next time we tape them. Otherwise, I'll see you for our next video.